Let's take another look at what is a patient. Patients are organisms that encounter conditions early in life that make a big difference to things that happen to them later in life. That happens in utero, it happens in infancy, and it can affect the, if the risk of heart disease, of diabetes and of obesity 50, 60 years later. As background to this, it's helpful to think about how organisms adapt on different time scales. On a very short time scale, they have homeostatic adaptation, so regulation of blood pH, of uh, the amount of water in tissues, things like that. That goes on on a scale of seconds to minutes. Then there's rheostatic adaptation, which basically is resetting the set points for homeostatic adaptation. That would be physiological adaptation to a different climate. Uh, say you go up a mountain and you need more hemoglobin in your blood, well that would be a rheostatic adaptation. It can take a week to do that. Then there's developmental plasticity. That is the kind of thing we're talking about now, where something happens once early in life and it has effects for the entire remainder of the life, so that's on the time scale of a complete generation. And then there's selection and genetic response uh, through uh, standard evolutionary means, and that's usually on a scale of 10, 100,000 generations, something like that. So these things happen on different time scales. Many of the non-infectious diseases originate early in development. These are an increasing part of the burden of disease in developed countries. They include the autoimmune diseases and atopies, and that's because, as we've seen, the developing organism doesn't experience normal symbionts, and because the standard evolved interactions with the immune system are not taking place, there's an abnormal response. Then there's cancer. The somatic mutations that lead to cancer are most influential when they happen very early in life because then they have the greatest downstream consequence, there's the greatest opportunity for mutations to accumulate in their descendants. Today we're going to talk about the metabolic syndrome. It's the third of these classes of early life effects. There the condition at birth affects probability of type 2 diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, and heart disease 50 or 60 years later. It's an amazing delayed effect. There were two early hypotheses about this sort of thing. In 1962, Jim Neal uh, came up with the thrifty genotype hypothesis. It was strictly genetic. It tried to explain why diabetes exists at all, but there's a problem with it. Hunter-gatherers don't encounter famines very frequently, so there probably wasn't significant selection for genes to get fixed that would handle starvation conditions. David Barker modified that idea in 1992. He came up with the thrifty phenotype hypothesis. It wasn't genetic determinism this time, it was developmental determinism. He was trying to explain why metabolic syndrome is more frequent in adults who are undernourished as fetuses and infants. And the problem with an adaptive explanation for that is that predicting adult environments on the basis of fetal nourishment probably wouldn't work. But we will see that the, this idea that you can have a predictive adaptive response has been resurrected and there is some evidence indicating that it might very well work. The mechanisms would be epigenetic. So here is some of the data that prompted all of these ideas. It comes from the Dutch hunger winter. At the end of the Second World War, between the fall of 1944 and the spring of 1945, the Nazis blockaded the Dutch and essentially tried to starve them to death. They went down onto a diet of less than a thousand calories a day, and you can see the result here. The children who at that point were in their mother's uteri were then followed after birth. And they were exposed either late in pregnancy, in the middle of pregnancy, or in the first trimester of pregnancy. So these are three month periods here. The outcomes were dramatic. And what, when the stress occurred was important. If it happened in the first trimester, early in gestation, then the result would be cardiovascular disease and general poor health. 
So that would be in this column. If it happened in the middle trimester, the result was kidney disease and diabetes and lung disease. That was in this column here. And if it happened late in gestation, there would be insulin resistance and diabetes. These were picked up in people 50 or 60 years later. Follow-up studies then asked, well, do you need to have something like the Dutch hunger winter to elicit this, or does it also happen in normal people? So here are some data from the Helsinki cohort study. This followed people uh, who were born between 1934 and 1944. And let me explain one of these panels. So the, the three panels are height, weight, and body mass index, BMI. The dotted line is normal, okay? So that's the population average. And these other lines are deviations from the population average. The solid lines are the, the growth of all children in the two birth weight groups. So these are birth weights above 3.5 kilos. These are birth weights below 3.5 kilos. And the dotted lines are for the 290 children who later developed type 2 diabetes. And what you can see is that later in life, the children who developed type 2 diabetes we're starting to get very heavy with very high body mass index starting at about age two. And that, that simply continued. So things that were going on during their childhood were having a big impact on the risk of diabetes later in life. In these panels here, the top one is for boys, the bottom one is for girls. The normal, out, the normal uh, weights this is, this is height, BMI, and weight. So the normal scores for these factors, height, BMI, and weight, would be right here. And these are the boys and girls who had coronary heart disease. And what you can see is that the people who had coronary heart disease all had low BMI and low weight between in the first two years of life. And they caught up a bit later on. This time scale here is compressed, okay? And then what happened, particularly in the girls, is that they overshot and they became obese during their adolescence. So a pattern of being very thin, undernourished, uh, during the first two years, followed by overcompensatory catch-up growth, seems to be a pretty good predictor for the risk of coronary heart disease. David Barker then took all of the births occurring in Hertfordshire in a particular period of time, and he plotted the risk of heart disease by birth weight here on the x-axis and by weight at one year on the y-axis. So this is how heavy when they were born, and this is how heavy they were when they were one-year-olds. These are relatively relative risks here. So 45 would be a relative risk of 0.45. The arrows which intersect right here at the mean, have a relative risk of 1.0. So that would mean no impact on, on uh, probability of ischemic heart disease. What I want you to notice in this picture is that the effects are present in small deviations from normal birth weight. So if you simply go down to a birth weight of seven pounds and, and a weight at one year of age of, say, 20 pounds, then your risk of ischemic heart disease is increased 25%. So this is an important observation. These are variations in size at birth that are experienced in all hospitals around the world. This is not the Dutch hunger winter. What could be regulating something like this? Well, the mechanisms that underlie these effects are very probably epigenetic. And epigenetic effects are mediated by DNA methylation, by individual uh, codons that are specifically regulated, by methylation binding proteins, by modifications of histone, which allows the DNA to unwrap and to expose genes for expression, by microRNAs and by RNA editing. And this list is probably going to grow. So all of these things are things that need to be investigated. The predictive adaptive response idea 
which is one that's being uh, really intensively looked at by Peter Gluckman and his group, basically is a developmental strategy that's changed. So it's changed by an environmental signal, and it has a delayed benefit and no obvious immediate benefit. So for example, the meadow vole's offspring will have a thicker coat if they're born in the fall and a thinner coat if they're born in the spring. The thickness of the coat that the, that the baby voles develop is not immediately adaptive. It is there in anticipation of what the temperature will be in a month or two. So here is a meadow vole and the thickness of fur on its body is being changed by developmental signals that the mother is receiving and then passing on to her offspring. There is a bias in this kind of anticipation. The fitness cost of making a mistake is not symmetrical. If a high nutrition environment is predicted, but the organism ends up in a low nutrition environment, there will be a greater fitness cost than if a low nutrition environment is predicted and a high nutrition environment comes along. Therefore, one would expect a bias in the way that evolution has shaped this kind of predictive response. And that's probably been enforced by, reinforced by maternal constraint and by the pattern of nutrition in evolutionary history. So here's some evidence that, umbilical, that epigenetic state at birth is predicting body composition in childhood. These are measurements of umbilical cord RXRA methylation. This is a retinoic acid uh, receptor that is mediating uh, the growth response in children. And if you look at how much methylation there is, or how much demethylation there is, uh, and look at the childhood's, child's fat measured at nine years or at six years, you can see that there is a significant relationship between this epigenetic marker and then how fat the child will be years later. Furthermore, if there is low maternal carbohydrate intake, that is what seems to be associated with methylation of this gene promoter. So what's going on here is the y-axis is the umbilical cord methylation for the retinoic acid uh, regulator. And here you can see maternal carbohydrate intake. The women who were in the lowest quartile had the highest degree of methylation. So this is beginning to establish a connection between a signal that is passed by the mother to the offspring to set the gene expression in the offspring dependent upon the quality of nutrition that that infant is getting. Now, there's an alternative to this way of thinking, and that is that these are byproducts and not adaptations. That claim would be that the response that we see is aimed at the immediate survival of the infants, which contributes strongly to fitness, and that it is worth paying a cost because those are delayed costs. They're discounted. They come much later, and those older age classes are contributing less to fitness than the younger ones. Now, this critique leaves open the issue of why the costs have to be paid at all. The natural hypothesis is some kind of constraint, but it hasn't been located yet. So, to summarize, early life events definitely affect late life health and disease. We're beginning to understand the mechanisms that might be mediating these effects, and we're beginning to see why they might have evolved, but several of these points still remain controversial. We don't see all of the mechanisms yet, and the degree to which the predictive adaptive response really evolved for that reason is not yet clear. So research is exploding and answers are still being found. But what is certain is that the effects exist and they have significant impact on adult health.